This is the WTF Bach Podcast. Right that Work those fingers. This is the podcast about all things Johann Sebastian Bach. Brought to you by Evan Shinners. WTF Bach. Brought to you by Evan Shinners. Join WTF Bach as he guides your mind through a contrapuntal journey. And now, and now here's WTF Bach. Hello, hello, it's WTF Bach. Evan Shinners. Call me either. I answer to both. The goal of this podcast is to be your guide, to lead your mind through the mellifluous soundscape that shrieked from a quill pen between 1690-something and 1750, to help set your ears on certain aspects, structural, biographical, or entirely hypothetical, of the music of one J.S. Bach, to help you gain more appreciation for it. Now, this is an interview episode. I aim to bring on this show people who come from various backgrounds but are somehow all united around Bach, and at least in these early episodes, discuss the art of fugue. So my guest today, and indeed my first guest on this podcast, is one of the foremost pianists alive, Rad Meldau. He is without doubt one of the most influential, one of the most imitated, and certainly one of the most unique musicians around. And I could spend as much time speaking about his accomplishments, his merits, as I did talking to him But I won't, because our conversation is much more interesting. So look him up, Brad Meldau, M-E-H-L-D-A-U. Now, if anyone listening is a jazz musician, you probably already know pretty much everything about him. He was a member of the Joshua Redman Quartet. He made recordings with Lee Konitz and Charlie Hayden. His repertoire ranges everywhere from standards to Radiohead covers and Nick Drake. He's played with Wayne Shorter, Kurt Rosenwinkel, Pat Metheny, Renee Fleming. He even played vibraphone for... Well, you'll find out. Records on none such records. He's won the Miles Davis Prize, been nominated for 10 Grammys, won one... Well, I thought I wasn't going to talk about his merits, but look, the man is decorated. But what makes him the first guest? Well, he's completely obsessed with Bach. In 2017, he released an album where he plays straight-ahead Bach, followed by original compositions based on the preceding Prelude or Fugue. And I find this fascinating that someone with such an impressive background, one that is completely different in training from mine, could be so transfixed by this same work that I am, the art of fugue. In fact, when I met Maldau about six years ago, all roads led to Bach in our conversation. Hey, he said, you into the art of fugue? Now, we spoke for over an hour, and I thought about editing this chat, but as I listened back, I thought this is all valuable, especially for people who love music, because that's the impression I get from Brad. And often when you speak to someone as accomplished as he, they somehow seem jaded or constantly guarding their reputation. But the feeling that I hope that listeners get from this interview is that Maldau is really a guy who's so in love with music and he's not afraid to risk anything. He spoke about Mozart and Schumann with as much authority as anyone ever could. He even demonstrated passages from Brahms chamber music and Beethoven sonatas. He sees connections between Bebop and Bach and Plato in the New Testament. And in a very flattering way, he doesn't hesitate to turn the interviewer into the interviewee and flip the questions I asked him right back on me. Because he's always learning, always curious. And to me, that's the sign of a great artist. Now, I should mention, we had this conversation over FaceTime. Meldau in Amsterdam, myself in New York. So I had each of us record our conversation on separate ends so that we wouldn't have to rely on the audio quality of a FaceTime call. But sometimes, as you can see, when we interrupt each other or laugh at the same time, you can see sort of the lag between us, and I've tried to get rid of this. But since we FaceTimed, and Brad, I hope you don't mind me revealing this, I was able to see on the wall behind him Bach's Table of Ornaments, which Bach copied out for his 10-year-old son. It's sort of a key for decoding the very complicated and ornate signs which appear in Baroque music. It's a key to ornamentation. And I will leave the link to the table of ornaments in this episode description. But yeah, how cool is that? Behind Meldau, at the piano every day, is this key that Bach left his oldest son, who was in many ways Bach's first great student. And so Brad is a great student of Bach. And so I was very happy to speak with him. Wednesday, 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 Thursday, 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 on this special episode of the WTF Bach Podcast. And now, please welcome... Incomparable Brad Meldow. Brad Meldow, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks for having me. All right, so you are the first guest on this WTF Bach podcast, which up until now has dealt exclusively with the art of fugue. Since your background is such a diverse and interesting one, I think the best way to connect you to this very particular work of Bach is to first ask you some general questions, not even music-related, and then move on to questions about music, 
then the way that you practice the piano, then perhaps jazz and your creativity, and then finally moving to Bach, and then finally into the art of you. Does that sound all right? Sounds great. So the first question I want to know is, what books are you reading? Uh, I'm reading the Bible very slowly. It's been a uh, about a five-year project now, slogging through the book of Jeremiah. And uh, he's a scary dude. And at the same time, I'm reading um, some of the Upanishads. So kind of spiritual stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of slow reading. You know, I read a little bit, uh, read a little bit of scripture every day and uh, let it sink in. Is there any book that stands out in your mind, like one that you would reread? In the Bible? Um, well, all of the, um, you know, I did a record last year called um, Finding Gabriel, and it had some some of the uh, some of the prophetic um, uh, scripture in there. There was a quote from Daniel, and there was a little bit from Hosea. And I, I really love those guys because they're really uh, they're kind of bearing witness and screaming at everybody, everybody to sort of pull their head out of their asses. And uh, so, you know, certainly that the ones I've read most recently, the Book of Daniel, and it's also a beautiful writing. You know, in the um, uh, in the in the translation in the Bible, I have I think it's called the New American. Uh, version, which, you know, they're all kind of coming out of the King James version, uh, you know, from however many years ago. Um, and what you realize reading the Bible is that there's so, so much that you're saying, even the way you're thinking, the way you uh, form sentences, you know, at, at least myself, I've noticed it really, I read something and it's, oh, okay, that comes from there, you know, and then I uh, realize how well, this is Shakespeare, you know, Herman Melville, Faulkner, whoever it is, they're all so, uh, it's all in there first, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one of my friends told me that to be essentially educated, you need to be educated in three things, the Bible, Shakespeare, and the Greek and Latin classics. That sounds, yeah, it's a lifelong, uh, I mean, it's, it's very, uh, something that I never put together really was that the New Testament's in Greek, you know. So what you start to make connections is, you know, these very two different um, uh, streams of we, th we think of Greek philosophy and, and um, all that kind of Western thought as being more secular in a way because it's um, it doesn't have salvation as a goal. You know, it's more it's trying to figure out these first causes, but not with the idea that it's going to give you peace, you know, but whereas the Bible, it's trying to give you an explanation that will maybe, maybe give you some uh, some solace or not, you know, or damnation. Um, but, you know, when, when you realize it's in Greek and you start reading the epistles of Paul and stuff like this, you see there's some connections there with, with Plato and, and also just that it's the same language, you know, it becomes really interesting to, to glue it all together, which is something I like to do in music and, and, and everything, you know, is to, is to see how things that seem like they're disparate are, are all connected, you know, the, the further you go back. Now, is there a book, just any book, um, that you've reread more than any other book. Well, because because I'm talking with you, I can tell you there's a book I want to reread very soon, which is um, Dr. Faustus. Thomas Mann's a huge, huge one for me. That one in the Magic Mountain, Death in Venice, Tonio Kroger. Uh, Thomas Mann is really big. Yeah, there's. I read Dostoevsky when I was in in high school, and it sort of changed my life. And I remember being really excited, but it was a long time ago. And I I know if I read the Brothers Karamazov now. For instance, I know it would do something different for me, you know, almost 50 years old. Have you ever committed to memory a large amount of text, like a speech or a poem? Not really, no. Um, if we start talking about music, you know, I'll have to tell you that memorization is, is really, um, it's not one of my strong points. You okay. know? And as a jazz musician, I'm, I'm always trying to dig into the the lyrics of these, you know, standards from Jerome Kern and Gershwin and Rodgers and Hammerstein, and they're always great. Um, and I sing along. I was just learning Smoke Gets in Your Eyes from uh, from Jerome Kern. And I said, oh, what a beautiful lyric. And I don't even think I could tell you what it is right now, you know. <laughs> they asked me how I knew that my love was true. Then I can't get any further, you know. So, uh, yeah, so I, I've never really done that. It's a, it's a good idea. Um, so the first thing I noticed when I saw you play for the first time was that you have a very strong left-hand technique. Are you left-handed? No, I'm definitely right-handed. Do you remember a time in your life when that maybe started? Okay, so briefly, I started out with a classical training um, and uh, had sort of general piano lessons from the age of 5 to 10, you know, learning sort of simplified 
tunes and just learning how to play the piano and read music. Moved to West Hartford, Connecticut when I was 10 and studied with a woman there named Ruth Hurwitz, uh, who was Juilliard trained, had had a career uh, as a classical performer. And, and within, you know, I don't know, a few months, I was really starting to play repertoire, really started to get a technique on the piano. And basically the technique she taught me is the same technique I have now. And when I was 13, I started getting into jazz. Jazz took over, and for, a per- for the next period of almost 10 years, I didn't play any classical. And I built up a jazz technique of the music that I wanted to play, which was small ensemble, modern jazz, let's say, starting from bebop through, through modern, uh, more contemporary stuff, which is mostly your left hand, uh, as Fred Hirsch says, very funny, he says, the left hand claw. You know, your, your left hand is comping, as we say, it chords, chord shapes, and your right hand is, is, is doing all the, all the uh, melodic stuff and the figuration. So most jazz players, myself included, we have a tendency to get a stronger technique, a stronger facility, and, and a stronger, we're improvising, so a, a, a more of an ability to improvise in the moment with our right hand. So I think when I was around... Let's say 21, I started getting back into classical music and I was also listening to great classical piano player, uh, jazz piano players like Phineas Newborn, Oscar Peterson, Art Tatum, some piano players who really could burn with their left hand as much as they could with their right hand. And I think it became sort of just this obsession, like I'm going to get my left hand to catch up with my right hand. Do you weep while listening to music or do you get goosebumps? And was there like one instance when you realized, oh my God, there are you know, tears of joy coming from music? Wow, that's a good question. Where I, I, be, I mean, I know I've wept a lot, but the first one, I don't know whether it was, hmm, whether it was some early pop music I heard when I was a really little kid or, you know, maybe some, some classical stuff. Um, it it might have been Brahms because Brahms is the one who still just goes right to my heart, you know, and just kind of leaves me splayed. So, for instance, I could still weep when I listen to the slow movement of the C minor uh, piano concerto, uh, the, uh, piano quartet, you know, with the cello melody. That's just, I'm already, oh. Yeah, it's so sad and beautiful. A lot of Brahms movements like that. Um, I would weep from the slow movement of the clarinet quintet. Yeah, any number of uh, Brahms does that to me for sure. I'm not sure what the first one was, though. How about in dreams? Do you dream that you're playing the piano and were you ever able to capture music you heard in a dream and bring it into real life? I have several of my tunes that I've recorded. Um, Most recently, I think uh, this actually became the title of a a record called Seymour Reads the Constitution, which is a waltz. Um, So probably I dreamed about and that's all I remembered and I woke up and and continued turning that into a tune. A few other tunes I've had like that and then it's sort of fading away and it happened a lot. It happened for years and I then I finally one time I got out of bed and went right to the piano and then, so since then if that happens and I've got a lot of ones that are funny that they're just really stupid or um, or they're really unoriginal. And I always think of that story, I don't know if you've heard that about Schumann when, when he was kind of losing his mind um, and he was in, in the, the mental asylum. Um, he started thinking, oh, I'm hearing this beautiful music and he started writing this thing. And I think it, it was already something that he had already written. I'm not sure if you, it was a concerto or something. And, and so sometimes our, our mind is playing tricks on us and, and we think it's this heavenly music when it's really just might just be something that already exists. Yeah, something firing in the neuroreceptors. Yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about um, practicing. Is practice for you, is it an everyday thing? Definitely. Um, I would say, I would put it more like um, uh, time at the piano, music is an everyday thing in one way or another. And often that's what we normatively call practice. Um, So, but also... It could be because I'm writing a lot of music. So it might be that I dive into writing something and then I lose four hours and then there's no practice. It might be 
that I'm studying something or reading something and that takes over. So it's not really, uh, it hasn't been for a while a steady um, uh, regime, let's say. Is it a certain time of day? Do you set aside certain hours or do you kind of get to it between your, your chores? I start as soon as I can <laughs> okay. because it's really what I want to do. And the older I get, the more I feel like time's running out. So I have, you know, I have three kids and they're a little older now, so they don't need uh, my wife and I as much, you know, all the time. Uh, but I want to be there for them. And then as soon as I can, um, I'll get at the piano, you know, I'll get involved in something. And so a lot of times it's right when I wake up before they get up. Okay. Or kind of hide out down here in, in, my, uh, in my basement where the piano is. And I, and I don't come up because I know if I go upstairs, somebody will say, hey, you're... You need to do this, you know? Yeah. But, you know, I would say an average of, I don't know what it is, three or four hours a day, sometimes more, involved in music some way or another. Do you have any rituals before you can really start shedding? Like, is there coffee or tea or is it meditation? Or do you just wake up and go down to the basement? I do have a meditation practice, but it's a little sporadic. And um, if I'm patient enough, I can start with a 20 minute meditation, sitting meditation. But sometimes I think that the universe or God uh, is just telling me, don't just, just get right to it, you know? <laughs> and coffee, yes. And coffee isn't, it's just, uh, yeah, it's a ritual, but it's, um, you know, caffeine is just, thank God for caffeine. Can you profile yourself practicing at three different ages in your life for the various age groups listening? Like, can you give us a portrait of you practicing at, say, 16 and then maybe 23 and then 35 or something like that? Yeah, well, maybe I'll go a little earlier when I had Mrs. Hurwitz as a, as a teacher. And so let's say I'm 12. And it, then it's really more um, uh, uh, following her direction. So that was you keep a notebook. And you really should practice an hour a day. And you have, you know, an old spiral notebook and there'd be a week of the lesson. And, the, and what we were, let's say, when I began with her, I had um, uh, the, the first Bach um, C minor prelude and uh, the Chopin Nocturne in E flat major and something from Microcosmos, Bartok. So I'd have to work on all of those for each lesson. And... I'd have to write down how long I practiced every day. And then I had a scale in each key and I'd work on the scale. Um, you know, let's say it was the a, a flat major, just normally. And then I also had to break it up rhythmically or in triplets. And then I had to present that to her the next week. Um, so I was supposed to do an hour, but it usually wasn't that much because I was a kid and I wanted to go and play or whatever. So it would look like 30 minutes, 55 minutes, 60 minutes, 20 minutes, you know. And uh, But really, I was doing what she said. And then uh, jumped to 16 years old. Then I'm into jazz. I'm not taking classical lessons anymore. And I had, I had had a jazz teacher, um, but I stopped studying with him. And I was basically on my own at that point. And then practicing was also transcribing, transcribing a lot of solos, Charlie Parker solos, Pianists I love, like Bud Powell, uh, Wynton Kelly, McCoy Tyner. Um, finding one particular lick that I loved and then trying to play it in all 12 keys, trying to play it at different tempos, that kind of thing a lot. Trying to learn tunes. So that was more like 16 years old. And jump ahead to my 20s and right up until now, because I don't want to blab too long, uh, always some classical literature that I'm working on. And through trying to play that um, and trying to play it with with some integrity and maybe beauty, um, also absorbing the music itself as material for me as a musician, as a composer and an improviser at the same time. So I'm always interested to know what the first thing that a musician does when he or she sits down at the instrument. Is there the same thing every time? Do you play a C major chord? Do you play scales? Do you pick up with you know a chorale or, or something you were looking at yesterday? Well, I, what I do a lot is... Um, Let's put that in the, in the context of a gig. You're, you know, us pianists, we don't get to bring our piano around everywhere, uh, most of us. So I want to feel out the piano. So what I do a lot is this sort of chorale-like thing where I'm going to feel out how good the piano is, the touch, all those things. And I play something like this. 
just with my left hand first. Going through triads a bit. And now I modulate. Et cetera, et cetera. And then what I do is I, I sort of get around, I, I've played through all 12 tonalities a bit and played triads. And then, and then so that kind of does everything at once for me. I, I'm, I'm warming up, I'm getting, I'm getting used to the piano. And, and also it's, I do it at home a lot because it's my own piano. I'm, I'm getting acquainted with simple things that are always, always a challenge, like controlling dynamics, you know, being able to play soft, being able to bring out, you know, one pitch. I may try to bring out the low pitch too. All that kind of stuff. Now, what's what's on your piano? I find that there are two types of pianists. You know, there's the one that's got books all over the piano, and then the other that's very neat uh, with a few special objects. Oh, where, yeah. where do you fall? Yeah, I have kind of you know, there's two sides on the desk, and I have one side that's uh, uh, classical stuff. Right now, it's uh, the Schumann Kerner Leader, Chopin Ballads and Bach English Suites. And then on the other side, I've got jazz stuff or stuff I'm working on. So they look different. The one is nice Henley. I love that color of the Henley editions. And then on the other side is an assortment of more loose papers, sheet music, that kind of stuff. So I sort of keep them separated, you know, so it's just easier to find stuff. I know where it is. Do you have a balance between purely creative work and just purely mechanical work like these fingers need to get on these notes as opposed to I, I need to come up with this beautiful idea? Yeah, you know, the way I frame it a lot is, um, and it's not my idea, it's uh, it's a guy, a, a great producer and musician named John Bryan, who's produced a couple of my records, and he talks about input and output. So um, we're, we're going through life, and especially when we're young, we get all this input, we're listening and listening and listening, and it's going in, and then if we're creative in the form of our interpretation of something or composition or improvisation, which is kind of what I work in those three things, it's the output. And the, you know, the rub is how the input leads to the output. And I think that is a very mystical process. And I always think of this thing that Rilke wrote in, in letters to a young poet, where he's telling this person, uh, it's, he, he says it's all about uh, gestation or pregnancy and a birthing. So the, um, the metaphor or the simile, whatever it is, is kind of that when something is growing inside of you, when the input is in you, you don't actually see it. You don't know what it's becoming. So what you do is you just absorb it. And then you work, you hone your craft, you work on all the technical stuff. But when you actually, for me, at least my experience has been that the, the creative thing is very mysterious. When it comes out, it's the, it's the sum total of all the things I've absorbed, but I don't know how it's going to be, just like you don't know what your baby's going to look like, you know. And, and to me, that's what's so exciting, you know, is when something creative happens, it's, uh, it's not willed, or I think it wouldn't be creative if it was, you know. So with regards to creativity today, do you, do you feel that we're in an age where for something to be popular, some aspect of it has to be sacrificed? Wait, so, like, how do you mean sacrificed? Maybe some element of the high art has to be um, removed or, or dumbed down in order to reach um, the general masses. Well, I think you have to, you know, I'm not going to tell you anything I'm sure you haven't considered, but just the dichotomy of high art and masses is, is really fraught. There's a lot of instability in that, you know. And, and when I think of composers, what I notice a lot, for instance, time constraints, you know, it seems like people work well under a deadline and or they also work well with limitations. So, you know, if, if Mozart had to write something and have it finished by a deadline and, and he churned something out, it may be this great stuff that we love now. Um, and it wouldn't have come out that way if he could have just gone on forever. Maybe it might not have even come out at all. So I, I think and even now uh, with the Internet, I see a lot of. Uh, people doing creative stuff um, because of the constraints, you know, because of what they're working with. And, um, so, yeah, I don't think you really have to ever really sacrifice anything. Really, I guess that would be my quick answer. <laughs> I want to ask you about fashion and music. 
<laughs> You're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, is is there a certain way you have to be, you personally have to be dressed in order to sort of, you, you know, I mean, how important are clothes to you when you're at a gig? When you're at a really important gig, how important is it, you know, what you're wearing? Uh, it is important. And I think the reason why it's important for me is to show the audience that I take it seriously that they came to hear me. So it's super old school. It's like if I'm going to somebody's house and, and uh, they're having a, a party or, or let's say they're having a funeral or a wedding or whatever, it's the same reason I would dress up for that, to show them that I acknowledge, um, I respect them. You know, it's a, it's a matter of respect. Um, and if I was a hip guy with fashion, then I, then I would take it. You know, I love it when I see people dressed really uh, and it's an expression Visually, too, I've got nothing against that. But for me, it's mostly, yeah, it's just that it's showing um, it's why I wouldn't show up in a dirty T-shirt or whether not because it's morally wrong, but just because I want to show respect. So I guess actually that does tie into a kind of morality in some way. Right. Well, so I'm gradually I'm making the transition into Bach, but I just <laughs> wanted to ask you one. I wanted to ask you one thing about um, one artist that you worked with, because, you know, you've worked with so many but if I had to ask you about one person, you played vibraphones on a Willie Nelson album? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what was that like? It was amazing, yeah. I mean, working with him was was amazing. And it was kind of, I don't know, I guess I had some balls then, you know, and I saw the vibes there. And I thought, let me, and his sister, Sister Mary, she was his usual piano player, and she tracked uh, some piano on that record as well. And we had very different styles, you know, she had a way of playing with him because they played together for years. And I was more, I was bringing some jazz stuff into the harmony. And, um, but her and I were always kind of like trying to duck around each other and the session was loose. So it was always like, well, who, who's up? Who wants to play piano on this? And we didn't want to step on each other's toes. So at a certain point I said, well, we'll let her have the piano on this one. I'll play some vibes, you know? So that, that's why that was, it was just to get out of her way a little. Um, so I'm going to throw out a few names that are associated with Bach and wonder if you could share your opinion on them, if you like them. Um, Nina Simone, Jacques Lussier, and Wendy Carlos. Do you like all three? Um, don't know Wendy Carlos. Um, I've only heard just uh, just a few things from Jacques Lussier, French guy, right? How do you say his last name? Yeah. Lussier? L Lussier, I think. Lussier. Love Nina Simone to death. Yeah. Wendy Carlos is switched on Bach. Okay. Okay. Have you heard it? I haven't heard it, no. Are there other synth Bach records you've ever listened to or electronic arrangements? Just a little from, um, there's a Keith Emerson on some Emerson Lake and Palmer. Uh, I forget which one, but again, I can't remember. I mean, re not really, no, not in any real sense. Okay, so when we met, I asked you about Glenn Gould, and your response was that he's become less important to you than when you were younger. And I, I sort of can't help but seconding that emotion. Do you know why that is? Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure because I have so much uh, uh, admiration for him and he's been such a, I'm not sure why that would be. Um, maybe because I heard other people playing Bach and maybe because I started having my own relationship with Bach. So it wasn't just my idea of Bach through him, you know. I I'm not a huge, uh, I hope you don't ask me too much about different you know because i'm not a huge i don't have tons of different recordings you know when you mentioned this harpsichord is the last time we talked I didn't, I didn't know him i haven't listened to much harpsichord um but when i heard andreas schiff and i listened to him it was just really a revelation because i, I realized wow there's this whole other way to play bach you know and it's less metronomic and um yeah so when when one looks you up on the internet the first things that sort of come up you know your first your jazz history and then Brahms and Schubert, then you have uh, Nick Drake and Radiohead and Coltrane, but it seems that Bach only recently appears in your wheelhouse. I mean, is that the case or is that just the way that the internet is perceiving it at the moment? I think it's also, it's the case, yeah, I, um, you know, with all classical music, I, let's say written music, you know, written Western art music, whatever you want to say, I really, for years... People were gleaning, and I talk about it, how important that music was to me as a jazz musician, uh, which is my bread and butter. Um, and they'd say, well, do you ever want to do something and, and with classical music or record some? And I was always really saying, no, 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 I don't. And, and my feeling, and I still feel that way, is that, uh, you know, why am I going to go play, 
you know, a Beethoven sonata when there's a zillion recordings that were just incredible, you know, uh, or, or, and so really with Bach, that was the other, it's like, why am I going to mess with that? You know? Um, and finally, I think what it was, was that was the compositional, I, I had something to say as a composer and very specifically, um, you know, that I could, I could align these short Bach pieces, the preludes or the fugues and play them right next to what I wrote. So people could make the connection. Um, because I think if I played them alone, I don't think it would be compelling. And, you know, I still wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to stand behind them the whole way. You know? Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you something about that. I don't know if you've already done that, but um, what would it take to get you to play a, a Bach-only concert, a just Bach concert, no improv? What would have to be on the program? What would have to be the occasion? Or is that something that just doesn't interest you? It's not that it doesn't interest me. It's just that there's not. I, I can't do it in this lifetime because I would have to, for me, what I think is I'd have to walk away from everything I'm doing now and it's a bit like, I think what you're doing, I'd love to hear about what, how you're doing, you know, the art of the fugue. I, um, I'd have to put everything else on the shelf for months. And I also don't think my brain can do that. I'm too scatterbrained, you know. I'm trying to work right now on four foray uh, nocturnes that I've been playing for 20 years. And I just want to memorize them and get them up to snuff. So maybe I could do a program. I've got this idea to write some things and do a similar record like I did, like the after Bach, write some things that are informed by the foray. But it's all I can do to just work on one foray nocturne and memorize. You know, I just, to, what you guys have to do to internalize something and get it up to snuff is why I'm not a classical musician. So uh, even the idea of doing a full classical program to me, I just, I don't know whether it's in the cards for me in this lifetime, you know. So let me ask you about um, memorizing, because, you know, I guess that it, almost almost every great musical tradition besides classical seems like it was the great oral tradition. And I was told that the best way to become a better jazz player is to transcribe. So have you ever considered transcribing? Bach, put on the record and say, I'm not going to open the sheet music. I'm just going to learn this invention off the recording. That is a great idea. I've, I've never considered it. Yeah. Have you done that? That's actually exclusively how I how I memorize, yeah. Really, <laughs> but of, of course, at some point you have a relationship with the with the with the text. Well, so I could I could tell you exactly what what I I do. Yeah. Um, I'll open up the book, and I will read through about fifty seconds of the music very slowly because I feel like that's all I'm capable of taking in at the time. And so, just to be clear, you're talking about the first time you've looked at the score. I might play through it just to make sure that I have the fingerings, but it's I almost start memorizing immediately. Wow. So so then I will I'll play about fifty seconds into my phone, I'll record it, I'll close the book, then I will play the recording on the phone until I learn it from memory, and then I will re record it into the phone, open up the book and check to see how, how accurate wow. I was. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, that's that's food for thought for me because I'm getting stuck somewhere, you know, because I'm I'm trying to do little snippets and I'm having the score in front of me and I'm looking away and um, and I'm missing all these details. There's also something unique about Bach. I mean, I don't know if I'm veering off, but this is Bach, I think, is I'd like to ask you that is is Bach different or harder or easier? Does it have its own unique uh, ramifications in terms of memorizing it for you? Different than different than, let's say, Beethoven or whatever else. Yeah, I mean, I think almost anyone can agree that it's harder to memorize than than most harder. most music yeah. yeah yeah it's just there's a lot going on because of the polyphony or because of the polyphony yeah right yeah, right. absolutely right. yeah right. and you know all the details of course i feel of course there's a lot of details in in all music but um I, it seems like there are more details in in bach mm. i mean yeah. but in some ways there aren't um i mean namely uh expression dynamics phrase marks so with the foray, and it's also it's also really frustrating because f these foray nocturnes are weird. I can't find a good addiction, uh, addition. I have two, and they're both full of mistakes and weird enharmonic things and things where I think, is this real? And, um, but there's a lot of dynamic specificity, and you really have that with Beethoven, too, where he's right. really telling you, okay, you know, there's a sforzano right here, and then it has to become immediately this, and that's really what that's part of the thrust of the actual narrative of the music and with Bach you don't have to address that as much because it's not there right 
Well, do you think it's there? Do you think Bach had it in mind to be there and it just wasn't the custom to write it down? Or is Bach's music so wonderfully plastic that it can sort of function in all these? I mean, obviously it can function in a variety of genres, but do you think he had that thought about dynamics and phrasing in the back of his mind? He probably did. It would have been great to hear him play his music, you know, um, because he probably had a, and, and this, I guess, is this is what early music people do is they try to get some ideas about what the, you know, um, but then with something like what you're doing now with Art of the Fugue, it seems like what's so great about it is that it's it's just the it's just the pure music and it's it seems like it's open. It's these four voices and and it's it's abstract in that sense. You know? Did you ever transpose Bach to learn it better? I think it was you who recommended that I do that the okay, first time so you... we met. OK. And I said, Evan, I'm having such a hard time memorizing I think it was, what was it? I was trying to memorize the G minor fugue. Because uh, then I wrote this piece on it and, and I was going to perform it. And I just, I can't, I keep on stumbling. And with Bach, what happens is, you know, this is Beethoven or whatever, you have sentences and paragraphs. You have, you know, next phrase. So if you want to memorize and you get off track, you can go back and jump on at a certain point. And Bach, it's so hard to do that. Whether it's the kind of perpetual motion of, you know, that's maybe a little easier, but there's never, he, it's never stopping in a way, right? Uh, it seems like a lot of it in the sense of my brain, the way it's working. So for whatever reason, you told me uh, to try it in different keys. And I started doing that. It was excru excruciatingly slow and frustrating. And I, I was just so uncomfortable after about 15 minutes. But I did that for a few weeks, and I, and I finally memorized it. And I'm not sure why, but I think it had something to do with making myself listen even harder to what the nuts and bolts, the voice leading, the relationship between the intervals in those four voices, um, and not just finger memory, muscle memory, what feels good, hearing it all like this blob, you know if it pulls you out of what you already know physically, you know? Right. So thanks for that, by the way. Well, sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I find that the strangest thing happens when you're transposing Bach is that I will make the same mistakes in transposition ah. as I would in the original key. And so that's obviously a sign that something is wrong in your brain if you're making right. it even in transcription. So I found that to be illuminating. So let me ask you this. What is wrong in your brain? What What's not going through? What do you think it is? So often I feel that what it is is that you're... This is coming straight from Lowenthal, my teacher. He said, the left hand wants to be harmonically conservative. And I really didn't believe this for a while. But then I started looking at the mistakes that I would make. And in fact, when there's a dissonance on the downbeat the left hand sort of wants to resolve the dissonance and play something consonant. Um, and and that's, that's, that seems to be the case almost with all, with, with many of my left hand mistakes. But I started noticing with Bach that in fact, all of the voices want to be sort of harmonically conservative. Yeah. And so if I'm making a mistake in transposition, it's because I sort of really refuse to admit that there is such a, a dissonance in this particular place. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, it's, uh, Bach is just too transgressive. I mean, that's that's so great for Bach. He he wins yeah, there, right? He did. So I heard this rumor that uh, it seems almost too good to be true. But when Charlie Parker went into his proverbial shed, he brought with him a copy of the Sonatas and Partitas for violin. Now, I'm not going to ask you if that's true, because I don't want to be stripped of that romantic image. But do you think the bird studied the brook? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've never heard that, so I couldn't tell you yes or no. So um, save you from that one. Um, but there's definitely a correlation. I think people people make that connection. And for me, what it has to do with and why bebop is great is kind of why Bach is so great. And it's that the melody contain. Let's just say you take one. Would you say it was the violin suites or? Yeah, yeah, the violin. Yeah, so it's a perfect example of a solo voice, one line. Let's not. Let's take. Let's take uh, counterpoint and polyphony off the table and just talk about one line with Bach. And it states not only harmony, but melody all at once. So the melody is the harmony. It's all there. 
And it doesn't have to do it by, you know, as great as Beethoven does, a lot of his motifs and his melodies are sort of a triad, you know? You know? And he gets a lot of, sometimes they're sort of banal, you know? Um, yeah. Which Glenn Gould would say, that's that's what's great about them or whatever, you know? But <laughs> Or it's the context, whatever he said. Um, but Bach doesn't need to do that, and Bird doesn't need to do that, because what was going on with Bird... Uh, right before in jazz was a lot of arpeggiation and it was beautiful and it had the, it had the blue notes in it of course and it was it was luxurious and, and rich and everything but bird was the guy who then found the way to make you know i'm playing really square now just to hear So there's there's basically whole steps and half steps in there, and there's also thirds, and, and not much else. So you're getting something that starts to sound like an arpeggiation, but right as it's about to become maybe something what was going on a little before, he gets he it's a scale. So and because it's a scale, it's melodic. We hear stepwise motion, and we also hear tension and revolution, which Bach is the king of within one line, you know? And that and that and the harmonic motion, it's moving all the time from note to note. So I, I think that's for me, that's the comparison between Bach and and, and Bird. Uh Mendelssohn said that if if humanity lost all hope, a single chorus from Bach could restore it all. And Pariah, he said that when he was injured, he would he took solace in looking at the scores of Bach, just looking at them. And I think that for many musicians, Bach has been a crutch. Has has he ever been a crutch for you in a difficult time? Or is his music something that you can only sort of look at when you're in the, the best state of mind? I think it's like I can I can I can look at it in any state of mind. And I think maybe because I'm a, a bit of a sentimentalist or what for me, uh, I, again, I, t I turn to Brahms or, you know, Mahler 5, Adagietto movement or something where it's uh, but but Bach has that too. It's just so um, it is you know you, you want you want to put in the God word. It's really to me it's connected to to God. And I'm I'm a person of faith, so that's that's evidence for me, you know, of God. I don't know how how else to put it. So there's something where you can feel the your suffering, and you can have that. It's not quite a catharsis the way it is listening to a Mahler or something where. That the pain is being represented in the music directly, and you feel that, and you say, "Oh, that's me. Thank you for understanding, Mahler." With Bach, it's like that's there, but there's God's in there too at the same time. I don't know how to explain it, but yeah. Have you ever been lucky enough to sing some Bach in an ensemble? No. Is and that you? something you'd like to do? I, I grew up singing, actually. Wow. Um, and just last year, I, I sang uh, bass in the Mass in B minor. But yeah, that was sort of that was sort of a wild experience because you're saying these words, mm. um, you know, in Latin. And regardless of how you feel outside of the music about wh whether or not this happened, while you're singing it, it's almost impossible not to accept the fact that this happened. You know, it's just such a real experience. And of course, singing Bach has been completely transformative. You know. Wow. Okay, so you can go back in time and you can choose one. You could have Bach play his Chaconne for you on the violin, or you could be at the performance of the St. Matthew Passion. Bach playing the Chaconne on the violin. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to say what, uh, what is your favorite Bach piece, but now that I said those words, what's the first thing that came into your mind? Oh, gosh. Um, no, it's too difficult. You know, Bach's different with... it. it it, every everything is on a high level. There's no. It's not like if you, you listen to Schubert and you go through his songs. It's like there's some duds and there's some really strong ones. Uh, everything's on such a high level that you can almost start anywhere, you know. Uh, so yeah, I, I almost wouldn't even want to try to say. What about um, you? <laughs> well, at, so I kind of have a go-to answer to that question, which is strange, but that happened because I guess someone someone sort of posed the same question to me. They said, I'm not going to ask your favorite piece, but what's the thing that just came into mind? And it happens to be this um, second gavotte from the fourth uh, French suite. 
And it, it's, it's just so, so unbelievably charming and offers this side of Bach that I feel like you don't... You, you, I don't know, it's like yet another face of this multifaceted person. Um, and yeah, it's, it's one of these compositions where you, as soon as you realize what it is, you say, I can't believe I've gone my entire life without knowing about the existence of this thing. But I mean, the, the, the same thing happens to me almost, almost all the time. Right, right. Amazing. Um, okay, yeah. so you said after you perform, you feel like you don't want people to, to come up to you or touch you because you feel sort of raw. Do, do you still feel like that? And, and secondly, do you feel like that after you play Bach? Um, I think I feel a little less like that. I think I've, you know, just having the opportunity to perform for so long, um, I've just kind of, I've gotten better at coming out of whatever that shell is. And, um, it may be something that has less to do with music, just, but more on just, uh, connecting with people more and, you know, taking life as it is. And I think most people aren't aware what you go through, particularly in a solo performance, um, how it's kind of like, uh, it can be very, it's emotionally draining or spiritually draining. I don't know what it is. Um, so I've, I've gotten better at that than I was when I was younger. You know, when I was young, I just took myself very seriously, you know, and I'm getting better at that as I get older. Okay. Um, you, you've also said what's really fascinating to me and great about music is harmony. And I'm sort of paraphrasing the rest of this. Uh, you said people think a lot in terms of great melodies, but often the harmony underneath is making the melody work. So now this is my transition question to the Art of Fugue, because is that essentially why this work of Bach is, is so great? It's the same melody done over and over again. Is that why this work fascinates you? Or is this perhaps the ultimate melody? Mm -hmm. It's one of those questions that uh, it, it's what everyone's trying to do, right? You're trying to get away from a, a kind of duality or a, a subject object you know, predicate something and have the opposite. It's, I mean, it really does that with melody and harmony. Because again, for me with Bach, the melody is the harmony. The harmony is the melody. So it sort of negates the question, you know. Like what I, like when I had that, I was saying that a lot, I think, to, to you know, I, I say that still a lot in regards to when I fall in love with a musician or, or a body of work, it's often something that I call a, a harmonic sentiment or it's kind of, it's their sound harmonically. And, uh, you know, Brahms, I think he got it from Schubert, but he'll have this very simple melody, um, but he'll do something. And, and so the really classic gambit is to have a very diatonic melody, but to put a minor hue under it, you know, and then you get this, you know, from, uh, let's say the, the middle of the, uh, the second Rhapsody or the first one, whatever, Brahms. And uh, that's not a good example. But let's say he did this. Maybe he does do this later. A lot of times they're, they're mixing modes and they're keeping the, they're keeping the melody the same. Uh, and, and Brahms loves to do that, and Schubert loves to do that. He'll uh, he'll present the same melody in a minor cast, and um, then they give their they give their harmonic sentiment. And in a way, the melody in in that context is it's more subjective, um, and maybe ultimately less powerful. You know, whatever it is, it stands apart from the harmony. And the harmony, I think, can is something that's harder to define. But for me as a musician, it's what attracts me to, you know, all the composers, you know, for Wayne Shorter as a jazz composer has a certain harmonic sentiment, you know, and if it was just his melodies alone, I couldn't describe him from his melodies alone, you know, like, I think it's George Bernard Shaw, one of those guys said, you know, Brahms is great, but you can't sing a, any of his, any of his symphonies. And, and he, I think he was talking about uh, the first symphony, the beginning of the first one, which is the melody is just this word, you know, very weird.
but it's all the harmony that's going on it that it's like I'm almost I, I'd rather hear the Brahms that side of Brahms but well, I wouldn't but I but I that it doesn't I don't miss the fact it's true what he says it's true the melody on itself won't hold up but to me that's fine no problem but then Bach it's it does you know it's it's got everything so it's kind of a yeah it negates the question in a way I just can't help from thinking about the ending of I mean that's that's very singable. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing. He was so wrong, George. I mean, he has some of the most singable melodies. But but there 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 is some of this problems like that first movement and, and you know where it's just uh, yeah yeah. If you had to explain to a child what Bach is doing with the art of fugue, what would you say? Hmm. Um. I'd say there's different voices doing things independently of each other and they all add up to make something that's one thing but whenever you want you could take them apart and each one of them would stand on its own and does that that sounds like it almost applies to all Bach but is there something particularly about the art of fugue you would you would say like what is it about the art of fugue that's different for you well yeah i think it's what you said it's that it's just this one theme you know that, that he uses in all these different ways you know so i might try to get somebody to listen to that and say to the kid yeah listen you're hearing this next one you know that it's it's a little variation on it you know and uh, i would also tell them the story about because i just love how it doesn't end you know i mean to me that that maybe would be one of my favorite uh, standalone pieces of bach is, is the last uh, contrapuntus or whatever you call it you know uh, because the the last you know, however many measures of that where it's reached, it's just so it's everything. It's it just gets so chromatic and intense, and it's just yeah. I, w- I won't even try to put it in words, but that's that's a high point in music for me. Is that oh, absolutely? And the fact that it doesn't end is for me, it's fine. That's what it is, you know. Okay, so let's say that you hear on the radio one day, it's the most important Bach discovery of the 21st century. They finally found the piece of paper where the completion is. Do you go, oh, oh shoot, you know, I liked it better as a mystery, or do you, um, I mean, obviously we welcome the discovery, but but there is something about the mystery. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Yeah. On, a, on a much less exalted level, there's, there's something that happens in the last 30 years in jazz, you know, or more, where reissues have come out, where they've grabbed... Uh, you know, all these, uh, let's say, the complete Savoy recordings of Charlie Parker, and you get this huge set of CDs, you know, 20 CDs, you know, which back in the day, they culled it into, you know, a few 78 RPMs, and then it became some reissues of a couple records, you know. Um, But they took the best takes, you know. And then you take the time and you slog through them and you hear some other takes, that are actually maybe stronger in some ways as a performance, the band is more together, but it doesn't matter because you've already have the one you fell in love with, you know, and that might be what on a very exalted level, I might have the same experience. Like, oh, but I already, I like this one, you know, I like how it doesn't end, you know? Right. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we, though, I guess we've proven that he did not in fact die uh, while signing his name in that final few guys. Like it was his son who wrote still, that, right? Yeah. There's still something that's just so incredible about that, that image. Um, yeah. that it's almost too hard to to let go about how beautiful that image is. Sure, sure. Okay. So two, two musicians, or as many as you like, but, you know, a living musician, a dead musician, your choice, they're going to offer their rendition of the Art of Fugue. Who are you going to choose? <laughs> hmm. Oh, wow. Um, any genre, any any era. Any genre, any era. Oh, man, can we come back to that? Yeah, one? yeah, of course. Yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, <laughs> All right. So I announced yesterday on Instagram that I'd be interviewing you, and um, I got a lot of excitement from my followers. And I had I told them to ask you questions. So Alfredo from Mexico, and he asks, "You're learning two new jazz tunes, and one has lyrics, and the other does not. Is there a difference in in how you learn them?" Yeah, for sure. I would I would try to learn the lyrics, and uh, I would try to alone so nobody else has to hear me try to sing it first um and then still be looking at the lyrics and thinking about what they're 
about because what the lyrics do is when somebody sets a lyric to a melody, it affects the way the melody's going to be phrased. Um, if you've got a word and it falls out, um, so like with the smoke gas in your eyes, they ask me how I knew. Um, you could be tempted as a jazz musician just to uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, because you're getting free with the phrasing. But if you think about that, a singer wouldn't sing it that way. So if you start with the lyrics, it gets you into a way of playing lyrically, which is to say that eventually you're going to scrap the lyrics unless you're a singer. Uh, but if you're an instrumentalist like me and you want to play that melody, it's a starting point to even think about the idea of lyricism. Because what I think we're doing as instrumentalists, what I'm trying to do anyways, is I'm trying to approx I'm, I'm trying to tell a story. And it's an abstract story, and that's what's great about it. But, but words and actual meaning are, are beginning, you know, to something to think about. And then I can throw them away, you know. I think I'd like to wind down from the Art of Fugue again to the more general and just ask you a few closing questions about advice, sort of being a musician and where you are in the world. So was there ever a time when you thought, maybe, maybe this isn't for me, maybe this whole musician thing is not going to work out? Hmm. Never, never. Uh, I, I really didn't have much other choice because I, I wasn't really good at anything else. You know, I I, um, I went to music school right after high school. I didn't have very good grades in high school. I got a scholarship into into um, into New School for Social Research and Manhattan School of Music, and those were the only two places I applied to. So I went to New School and. Um, and yeah, I think I knew I wanted to be a musician when I was a kid. And and then the main thing is, is it was immediately gratifying. Um, it gratified, I think, when you're a kid and the first time that you perform, at least me, and I felt the ego gratification of other kids liking what I did, uh, I was in. There was no turning back, you know, because people liked me for that, you know. And uh, it's like, why would I do anything else, you know? But that's just me. So if you could have all of your talent transferred into a completely different field, completely unrelated. You know, you could be a great um, paleontologist or something. Mm. Um, I guess something scientific or mathematical or the way they would connect because it's so fascinating to me and I'm so not good at that, you know. Okay. Um, so something, I guess that would be, uh, you know, black holes or whatever, you know, when you read about these things and... Um, they're talking about these really interesting ideas, how they come up with uh, theories about quantum mechanics or whatever that don't make sense to us with our way of thinking. But but then they say, but if you do the math and then you see some huge equation, you know, and it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's well, I can't do that. That's how they actually do that. I would love to, you know, because as soon as I, I'm uh, with my kids now, I'm doing first year algebra with them. And it's like the quadratic, whatever. It's just, I'm already... My brain hurts, you know, just it was never my thing. There's some things it was never something I was good at. I, I am challenged, yet it's fascinating to me, all that stuff. What do you say to people who say, oh, I don't like Bach. His music is too mathematical. Yeah, I had some, someone, uh, a guy I was talking to, he said, when people tell him that, he doesn't trust them. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of feel the same way. I really find it hard not to have something like judgment and something approaching contempt or whatever. Oh, what? you know, I mean, the things that really piss me off when people talk about Bach is when they say, um, oh, it's so, um, it's, it's not sensual. I've heard that, you know, where they say it's so, yeah, or metronomic or like, and, and it's all pointing at this idea that it's not, I mean, Bach to me is, it's completely sensual. It's so, it, it's so of the body. But it is, I think people do sense a, a, something that's more than that. And, and they kind of get freaked out or they just don't go far enough into it. You know, they don't really listen because of all the stuff that's around and all the cultural baggage. And I know I live here in Europe and um, uh, in, in Holland where there's, a, you know, it's a Protestant country. So some people love Bach here and they have a great tradition of doing St. Matthew's Passion every year, and people actually singing along to it, you know. But other people hate it, and, and they say it's because it's, uh, it reminds me of the church and the Calvinistic, you know, so people have things built up culturally against it, you know. 
Yeah, so let's talk about just uh, about Europe. I mean, can can I tell the listeners that you're now a European citizen? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, as of uh, okay. last okay. week. <laughs> right, right. So I'll say gefeliciteerd. Uh, Thank you well. Do you do you find yourself happier there or do you find something about the European culture that's influencing your music that, you know, maybe is different from being in New York? I don't think so. You know, also for me I'm very wary of talking about European culture because it's so varied from country to country. Um and even part of a country. You know what you have in in countries like this one and also Germany, Italy, France that that I have a little familiarity with is you have a northern sensibility and a southern one. Just like in the states actually. Very similar thing. I don't know why that is, but it is in terms of uh religion, uh, diet, you know, the cuisine, everything. Um, so even within one country, you get so much variation. Um, what I feel as a musician is it's it's been long enough now where it's to go back to that input output thing. I don't want to sound like a fuddy duddy because it, but it just is what it is. Which is the stuff that I'm trying to express has been things that have seeped in for such a long time, and it's the culmination of all these decades of my life. So. It might come from something from some pop record from uh, when I grew up in Connecticut, or it might come from some New York experience, or it might come from some more recent experience in Europe. But just all that to say that it's not in real time as conditioned by whatever experience I'm having here now as a person, uh, you know, living here. All right. So, just final questions here. Um, rapid fire. Just say what comes to your mind. The Hindu Vedas or the Tao Te Ching. Hindu Vedas. The violin sonatas and partitas or the cello suites? <sighs> cello suites. Haydn or Mozart? Mozart. Lightning Bolt or Ween? What's Ween? <laughs> that, that band. Oh, Ween. I don't know them. I don't know either of those bands. Oh, you don't know either of them? Okay, okay. We'll skip it. What's your favorite video game? Uh, Millipede. Millipede. <laughs> Tell me about Critter's Buggin. Critters bugging. That's some. Oh, that's Matt Chamberlain, right? That's his band. Right. Love it. Love it. Great. <laughs> okay. So, finally, just some advice. Can you give advice to your former self? Do you have advice to a young musician listening? And what bad advice do you often get thrown around? Hmm. Uh, advice to my is advice to my younger self. Um, uh, follow your heart. Um. Advice to a younger musician: Follow your heart. And uh, um, advice, uh, bad advice, not to follow. Um, uh, don't listen to someone if they're telling you not to follow your heart. <laughs> okay, wonderful. <laughs> um, so it's been a real pleasure uh, talking with you. Likewise, oh. thanks for having me, Evan. But but before I let you go, we got to go back to that question. Oh no! Two people. They're going to offer up a rendition. Of the art of fugue, one you know, living or dead. Okay. Um, damn, why is this so hard? Uh, I guess living. I, I want to hear you do it because <laughs> I'm super curious, and I already love the way you play Bach. So it would be you. And for dead, um, yeah, I'd love to hear Beethoven play it. For for the record, I was not fishing for 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 me. Of course, I was I was hoping you were going to say something like uh, Tom Waits or 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 some something like that. I but, kept on trying to I, do that. I kept on trying to be all postmodern or whatever. But I honestly, I don't think I'd want to hear Tom Waits. <laughs> Maybe yeah, but that might be cool. Who knows? Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Brad Mando. It's been um, it's been really great talking to you. Thanks, man. Cool. Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Gabby, for always providing your color commentary. And special thanks to Jesse and Forever, Eddie Barbash, and producer This Land Is, and my Instagram followers who helped me come up with a list of interesting things to ask Mr. Maldow. Now, we spoke about a lot of stuff, so I'm including any relevant links to any authors or music we spoke of in the episode description. Please check that out. Before this episode aired, right before it aired, Mr. Maldow wrote me and said, Ah, I thought of someone that I want to hear do the Art of Fugue. Of course, I thought of another person, John Coltrane. 
keep that in mind. Share this with your friends, because honestly, when it comes to music, where else can you hear such an in-depth discussion of Bach's fugal techniques and also find out what Brad Maldo has on his piano? Stay tuned for the next episode, which will return to a careful analysis of the art of fugue, continuing with the Stretto Fugues in Contrapuntus 5. Thanks very much. You are listening to the WTF Bach Podcast. We have a brand new podcast and we want to hear from you. Got suggestions? You want a specific piece of Bach analyzed by Evan just for you? You can write to us. Do you want to partner with us? Write us at the WTF Bach Podcast. Send us a donation on Venmo, Cash App, or PayPal at WTF Bach. Help keep this podcast alive. Support us. Find the links in the episode description. What a, what a great day to be listening to WTF Bach. Thank you for listening. Listen, listen, listen.